Right, the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is very related to the laser, I think, um, is to do with a comment that I got the other day, and it's the kind of the, the topic of it is nothing new, but um, I had one and I thought I'd talk about it. Basically, an older potter reached out to me and said that they thought that um, I was using too many tools and therefore it was having an impact on the personality of my work. Now that you probably, if you've been doing this for a little while and reading the internet, you've probably seen a variation of this argument because it comes up quite a lot. Um, and it, I, I sort of get where it's coming from, but you can kind of break it down into two parts of the argument. The first is the tool use. So I get that using the grid, using the laser, as I said, it sounds like I'm throwing to a very precise number, but realistically, what I'm doing is I've mapped out a specific point in space and I'm trying to throw to that. Um, and even though it's, you know, it's laser cut and I'm using a, a laser to project into 3D, actually it's no different to a physical guide. The way I used to do it was a paintbrush stuck in a ball of clay on the edge of the wheel. And this is the same logic. Um, it's higher tech and it's it's no more precise. The the kind of the, the clarity of the mark is still a single point in space that I'm able to throw to. And the limit is my skill rather than the resolution of the mark. So I'm aiming to hit this point um, and I'll get close. But the, the fact it's a laser point and it could theoretically be very accurate is sort of a bit redundant when actually what's going to hit the mark or not hit the mark is a fairly fallible human being. Um, so I think this technology looks more like I've gone too far than I actually have. And so I can understand that it provokes more of a reaction than I feel it warrants when you actually kind of stop and think about what I'm doing here. So I get where people are coming from with that. I don't agree with it, um, but fair enough. But the, the comment was along the lines of um, that it would be better for me to throw, to do away with all the technology and the only tools I should be using are a sponge, a rib and a cutting tool. And I fundamentally have an issue with that. Um, and it's, it comes down to what are you trying to achieve when you make work? Because the, the person who left the comment said that I shouldn't, I should throw without using a guide and without using scales to measure the clay. Now, I sort of understand if you're a beginner and what you're trying to do is develop the ability to throw to a certain height without tools and to gauge the weight of a ball of clay. Those are skills that you can have in addition to throwing, so you can get better at those and they will work in conjunction with your skill at throwing. But they don't actually add anything to the finished piece. No one who buys a piece of your work will know that you've done it. And so I kind of see it as, yes, it's more impressive, and yes, it adds something to the backstory of the skill of the potter, if they can do that. But equally, it's harder to throw while talking. And so if what I was doing was reciting the alphabet backwards, that would be technically more impressive than throwing without doing that. But I don't think it adds anything to the quality of the work. What I do think is that it will detract from the end result. So I will not be able to throw as good a piece while reciting the alphabet backwards. And I wouldn't be able to throw as consistently if I throw without the gauge. Now, who suffers when I make the pieces worse? 
uh, is probably my customers because I'll still get one good example piece to post on my Instagram um, but the people who order it will get less consistent results than they would if I just used my equipment. This, what I do is um, all with the goal of making the workflow more efficient but more consistent. So I want people to get the best possible piece that I can make and I don't want more variation in that. So I think you're, you're only doing your customers a disservice if you make worse pieces uh, specifically so that you not even sure whether it's feel better about the process or feel more I'm not quite sure what the incentive would be to forego any useful tools I, I can kind of understand not wanting to embrace every single possible tool all of the time but when there's something as provably useful as a throwing guide which have been used you know forever there are traditional throwing guides made of sticks that you would use to check the height and width of the bowl. Um, Tombow, I think, the, the original kind of Japanese one is, I don't know. But anyway, there's something that have been around for forever. Um, I think you have to evaluate why you're reluctant to use them if they make a piece better. So I don't think you need to justify the use, I think you need to justify the lack of use uh, if what they're doing is detrimentally affecting your work. And if it's so that you can say that you didn't use them, then um, I, I, it's not an argument that I get on board with, let's put it that way. I know for some people that's a plus, um, and some customers will prefer it if you get a less consistent mug. But but I don't, also don't think that's a that should be the default. I don't think you should be aiming to make pieces that are worse just to avoid using tools for avoidance sake. The next thing is personality of a mug. Now I kind of feel like there are two aspects to this, and I think the personality, if you can tribute personality to a mug comes from its inherent quality. So if I gave you a mug with no context, you'd have to pick it up, you'd check the weight, you check the appearance, you hold it in your hands, you feel the balance, all those sorts of things, which don't come with an explanation of how it was made. So those are all the intrinsic part of the mug and you can assess them yourself when holding the mug. But you can't tell if it was, well, I mean, I say you can't tell. If you can't tell, you can't tell. So if there's a mug and you cannot tell whether it's been hand thrown or slip cast, then that's not an integral part of the piece. If its origin isn't obvious, because obviously some slip cast pieces still have the seams on. Some 3D printed clay pieces have the, 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 the ridge is made from 3D printing, so they, they show how they were made, and that's fine, so you can tell, but sometimes you can't, and if you can't tell, then it's not, the parts of it that you can't tell by looking at it are not integral to the mug. So if I gave you a mug and told you it was thrown by a master potter who used absolutely no tools and dug the clay himself, and fired it in a wood fired kiln, or fired it in a kiln, and he did absolutely every part of the process by hand himself in traditional ways, you'd assess it as being one thing. If I then told you actually, no, that was one that was churned out of a factory somewhere and they were made as quickly and as cheaply as possible, you'd assess the mug as being something else. But in both cases, the actual mug itself has not changed. Um, it's just your perception of it. So that has to be something different. The perception of the mug is different from the mug itself. So I can understand why you would say that throwing with more tools alters how this person personally perceives mugs. And that's fine. 
Yeah, that is that's something you can say. Is I do not value pieces made with mortals as much as I value pieces made with theatres. That's fine. The comment actually said that pieces made with tools had less character and the piece had a relationship with the tools and not the maker. Which I, for obvious reasons, I don't agree with. Um, but also, I kind of feel like the tools are a part of what makes that piece. So when you look at someone like Kurt Hamley, who makes, who designs from the ground up, he's created the processes that he uses to generate the moulds that he uses to generate the mugs that he designed. Those tools are all part of him. They're, his character is through the entire process. So to say that they have a relationship with the tools, fine, but the tools have a relationship with the maker, so the end result also has a relationship with the maker. So again, I'm not, I'm not on board with that one either. I understand subjective perceptions of pieces, you know, that's entirely your thing, um, and if you want, if you prefer something, you prefer it. That's, there's not a whole lot you can say to that. So, don't argue with that, but um, I do take issue with absolute statements like pieces made this way have less character, when character subjective and very vague, um, and you can't measure it, plus it doesn't really make logical sense that that would be a thing anyway, because it, it just kind of... So long as everyone's being transparent and not lying about how a piece is made, then it has the character it has, and it has the relationship to the process that it has, and we're all on the same page and everyone gets to pick what they want. So finally, the last part of this is unsolicited advice, because the reason this is coming up is because not because someone said this, but because someone said this to me in the sort of... it was explicitly written as it, I should change my process to fit with how this person felt it should be. Now obviously they've been doing it a long time, I'm not going to knock their experience, they clearly knew what they were doing and they had their own process and I can fully respect that. That's something built up over most of a lifetime um, and I wouldn't expect them to well, you can't rush out and embrace every new thing, which is sort of the point I'm going to get to, which is about unsolicited advice. So we all... I'd be amazed if there's anyone who hasn't had unsolicited advice, and probably everyone's given it at some point as well. Because it is one of those things, it's, it's very easy to think you're doing the right thing by trying to help someone by giving them unsolicited advice, and it is also very easy as the person being given the advice to not appreciate it as much as the person who's giving it thinks that they would. And there's that sort of disconnect between the person. It's quite a throwaway thing when you're giving advice. You feel like you're helping, you can say it and move on with your day. Um, but if someone gives you advice in a way that sounds like a personal attack, it's much harder to receive that positively as the recipient of the advice. So there's this big disconnect between the two. And you sort of need to be a bit aware of that when giving advice, how you phrase it, because there are obviously better and worse ways to tell someone they're doing something wrong, in your opinion. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of really brought home when you're a new parent, because a lot of people have been parents and when you're a parent, every single thing is kind of a, an obstacle that you try and figure out the right way and you figure out what works for you and it's such a relief when you figure it out um, and you can, you know, you've got your baby to eat or you've got them to sleep or whatever it is you're kind of working through. It's such a relief once you find something that works for you. Um, there's such a strong and it's like it comes from the best possible place, the, the compulsion to tell other people who are struggling with the same thing, what worked for you. Now the problem is that even within a household, uh, two babies will respond differently to different things, different things will work for them, and you can't try everything. If you're going to try and do 
like baby led weaning or or cry it out sleep training or whatever you've got to stick to it for a few months in a few months time the baby's a different baby because you know the amount they change in the first year or two is just ridiculous you cannot keep up with them if you're only trying one thing there's no way you're going to try multiple things so being told you're doing it wrong and then being told what worked for someone isn't actually helpful because there isn't time to implement that before it's too late anyway. You have to pick one thing and stick with it. You don't know if you're doing the right thing. It's incredibly tiring and stressful at the best of times. And being told you're doing it wrong will happen to you quite a lot. And it's just unfortunately you can't know what the right thing is until you've tried something and stuck with it. So. The most well-meaning advice, most well-meaning, the advice which is most well-meaning, I don't quite what I mean by that, um, people give advice that's very well-meaning and can be good advice, but you don't know and you can't do everything and it ends up just ruining your day being given advice, which is not at all what the person meant. And partly it comes down to wording and then partly you can check with someone if they want advice first before you give it. So just say, you know, there was something that worked for me, would you like to hear about it? And they'll probably say yes out of politeness and maybe they'll say yes because they really want to know, but at least you give the option for them to say no. If you give someone unsolicited advice just as a, what you're doing is wrong, this is what worked for me, it's it, it's never going to be received the way you mean it, I, or very rarely going to be received the way you mean it. So that's just something that kind of was particularly hammered home for me in the first year or two of having a baby because I completely understand where everyone was coming from but you get so much advice and every, yeah it, you, and now with a two year old I have the same compulsion to give people the advice despite knowing all of that so this is no way a criticism of that impulsion to give advice just saying that when considering giving advice, also consider what it's like to receive advice um, and then consider how you word it. Hopefully that's been interesting and coherent. I don't know that it's going to be as coherent as I intended it to be, but thankfully I wrote the thoughts out while I wasn't throwing, so it's a blog post which might make more sense if what I just said didn't. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on where you stand with this sort of stuff. I know. Um, everyone has their own point at which they think things have gone too far with tools, whether it's 3D printing or uh, paying someone else to slip cast your work or whatever, at which point you kind of you stop being comfortable with it. So it's an interesting topic with no right answer. Uh, obviously these are just my thoughts on it. Um, and I'm sure my thoughts will change over the years. This is where I kind of feel like I'm coming from now, but maybe when I'm 50 years in, I'll have completely different thoughts or I'll have the same thoughts but everyone else will have moved on and my thoughts will will seem different in context but um, yeah so this has made you think anything please let me know what in the comments and um, hopefully it came across I'm not looking to start any arguments or I'm not complaining about having received that comment um, just there were some parts of it that I thought were interesting and worth examining further. Um, I'll link to the blog post, I'll link to all the tools I mentioned in the other part of the video in this one as well, um, and have a good rest of your day.